The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Felix Chisegedi Sholombo, President of the Republic of the Democratic Republic of Congo. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Felix Antoine Chisekedi Shilombo, President of the Democratic Republic of Congo, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Your Excellency. Monsieur le Président de l'Assemblée. President of the General Assembly of the United Nations, Heads of State and Government, Secretary General of the United Nations, heads of delegations. The convening of the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly affords me the opportunity to share with the member states of our organization the vision and the major concerns of my country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, about the current challenges facing us in the world. Having said that, I wish to preface my remarks by congratulating His Excellency Mr. Dennis Francis upon his election to uh, election as president of our Aug August Assembly. And I assure all the members of his bureau of the support of my country as they go about their noble mission, the mission conferred upon them by our institution. I also wish to thank the outgoing president, Mr. Chaba Kuroshi, for his far-sighted leadership and his devotion, which contributed to moving forward our discussions and finding concerted solutions. I also wish to extend my gratitude to Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, for his active and ongoing commitment to peace and international security. President, as our session unfolds here in New York, the people of Morocco have not yet finished mourning their victims. Their wounds have not yet healed following, following the powerful earthquakes which took place in the night of Friday the 8th to Saturday the 9th of September. That earthquake caused the death of 3,000 Moroccans. It wounded 5,000, destroying several cities and areas of the kingdom. Furthermore, Libyans have not yet recovered from the trauma of the flooding, which claimed the lives of over 20,000 people and, and caused major damage on Sunday, the 10th of the same month. The people of the DRC welcome the mobilization of the international community to provide assistance to the kindred peoples of the Kingdom of Morocco and of Libya. We express our full compassion and solidarity and wish all the wounded a speedy recovery, all the wounded from these two natural disasters. President, beyond deploring these natural disasters, the current present of the the current session of the General Assembly falls at an exceptional period of our history where the world faces serious situations that threaten the very existence of human beings. There is the war in Ukraine, which has caused a food crisis marked by skyrocketing prices and shortages of basic goods. Added on to that comes the exacerbation of the effects of climate change and armed conflicts, with, which have continued to erupt in various places. These crises are mutually reinforcing, and they pose a challenge to the multilateral system and to international cooperation. And yet, the maintenance of international peace and security guaranteeing justice and human rights, prioritizing social progress and establishing the best living conditions are what everyone in the world wants and has always wanted. 
these goals need to remain at the center of our collective action following a truly multilateral and inclusive approach. We are called upon to work together with an eye to responding to these challenges which are existential in scope. For this fundamental re reason, I hail the relevance of this year's topic of our session, which is entitled Rebuilding Trust and Reigniting Global Solidarity, Accelerating Action on the 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals towards Peace, Prosperity, Progress, and Sustainability for All. This topic places the values of solidarity and of trust at the forefront of the factors for recovery and for accelerating the solutions to closely intertwined global challenges in order to move forward peace, security, and sustainable development. These values take on their full meaning in the context of the crisis that we are undergoing today. In this regard, it is vital to recall that at the halfway point towards achievement of the SDGs in 2023, given the climate disasters, the recurrent conflicts, the economic recession, and the persistent after effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, inequality and poverty have worsened. Hunger and malnutrition are on the rise. Humanitarian needs and the displacement of populations have reached record heights. Climate and environmental disasters have plunged the world into a systemic existential risk, which is very serious. In order to tackle these scourges, which pose a genuine threat to international peace and security, and which also constitute a major obstacle to the prosperity and progress of nations, it is clear that pulling our energy and taking a multilateral approach with mutual trust and solidarity is a major and indispensable approach. President, the maintenance of international peace and security constitutes the foundation of and the main objective underpinning the creation of the United Nations. Accomplishing this requires more determination and commitment on the part of everyone, given the current threats to peace and security in the world. African peoples do not often don't understand the equivocal attitude, the double standards at work, the ambiguities and the procrastination of our organization, especially of its Security Council, in certain political and security crises which are rampaging through Africa and sometimes have rampaged there for decades. This is the case, notably, of the forgotten crisis of Western Sahara, which has riven apart two kindred countries, Algeria and the Kingdom of Morocco, and that crisis has dragged on for several decades. This is also the case when it comes to Mozambique, Mozambique which has fallen victim to deadly terrorist attacks for roughly one decade in the province of Cabo Delgado. This is also the situation in West Africa, in the Sahel Sahara region. There, the UN troops are withdrawn, leaving behind them the memory of what they haven't achieved. This despite the fact that they embodied all of the hopes of uh, people that were caught in the clutches of jihadism. The Republic of Sudan is no exception either. Sudan is mired in a deadly civil war, which has pitted since last year the military personnel loyal to the president of the republic, pitted them against the rapid support forces under the command of General Mohammed Hamdai Degalo. This war has already caused much death and m much material damage as well. The international community is virtually indifferent to the Sudanese tragedy. 
This is also the place to broach a question of paramount importance to the Democratic Republic of Congo and also of prime importance for building peace in the Great Lakes region. I'm referring to the withdrawal of the United Nations Mission for Stabilization in the Democratic Republic of Congo, MONUSCO, the withdrawal of MONUSCO from our territory. Following a presence of more than two decades by the UN, it's time for my country to fully take its destiny in hand and to become the main protagonist of its own stability. We are grateful to the international community and to the United Nations for their support and their partnership. But we are also aware that the phased withdrawal of MONUSCO is a necessary stage to consolidate progress that we have already achieved. Nonetheless, it should be deplored that the peacekeeping missions that have been deployed in various forms for 25 years in the Democratic Republic of the Congo have not been able to stop rebellions and armed conflicts that have torn apart the DRC and the Great Lakes region, nor have they succeeded in protecting the civilian populations. Therefore, the phased, responsible, and sustainable withdrawal of MONUSCO, which was announced in 2018 and whose transition plan was adopted in 2021, is that planned withdrawal an anachronism given the changes in the political security and current social contingencies? It is thus illusory and counterproductive to continue to cling to maintaining MONUSCO to reestablish peace in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and to stabilize it. Furthermore, the accelerated withdrawal of MONUSCO is absolutely necessary to ease the tensions between MONUSCO and our citizens. It is the time to explore new avenues for strategic collaboration with the United Nations, mechanisms that are more in, lock, in lockstep with our current realities. This is why, in my capacity as guarantor of the, under the Constitution, guarantor of the territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence of my country, and to ensure the good conduct of our nation and the well-being of my compatriots. In this capacity, I've instructed the government of the Republic to begin discussions with the UN authorities to ensure an accelerated withdrawal of MINUSCO from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, moving up the deadline from December 2024 to December 2023. This is the meaning behind the step of our government, which addressed a letter to the President of the Security Council of the United Nations dated 1 September 2023, asking for the accelerated withdrawal of MONUSCO. In line with this accelerated withdrawal of MONUSCO, the DRC reiterates its demand to the Security Council of the United Nations to sanction all physical and legal persons acknowledged to be perpetrators, co-perpetrators, and accomplices, both material and and uh, intellectually, perpetrators of war crimes and crimes against humanity and serious violations of human rights, international law, and the Charter of the United Nations on Congolese territory. It is unjust and unacceptable for persons deemed to be responsible for the serious crimes mentioned in various reports of UN experts themselves on the security situation in the DRC, it is unacceptable for these persons to remain, to, to continue to enjoy impunity with the complete silence of our organization and its member states, which have placed the combating impunity as among their main priorities when it comes to internal and external governance. In this regard, the government of the DRC warmly welcomes the sanctions recently imposed by the United States on Rwanda for its support for the M23 terrorist groups and against one of its senior officials involved in the criminal undertakings in Congo. To recall, this terrorist group, which is a proxy for Rwanda, has not 
honored any of the commitments entered into by the heads of states of the region in the context of the Luanda and Nairobi process. Indeed, not only have they not left the positions they, they conquered, they are continuing to massacre the civilian population, and they are refusing pre-cantonment and cantonment. They are demanding a dialogue that will never be granted to them. The Democratic Republic of the Congo La République. The Democratic Republic of the Congo hopes that the other states will follow this good example set by the United States of America in order to support the common struggle against impunity to ensure the triumph of the ideals of justice and solidarity among peoples. The government of the DRC is awaiting the next meeting of the Security Council, which will focus in particular to uh, focus in particular on our request, and we want it to be constructive when it comes to the management of the delicate and laborious process of crafting peace in our country. President, there's another challenge that is of concern, of the utmost concern to all of the nations of the world. I am referring to the warming of our planet. Needless to say, there's been an increase in temperature for several decades that has affected the life of everyone, everyone in humanity, and is of concern to all of us. Having said that, I am compelled to note that despite the proclamations in good faith of polluters when it comes to stopping greenhouse gas emissions, despite the many fora convened all over the world to stem this scourge, including the 27 COPs, that is the conference of uh, member states of the UN to counter climate change, and despite the many resolutions and recommendations adopted at these various bodies, Despite all this, the warming of our planet is far from being restricted to the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. Despite the COP27 held in Sharm el-Sheikh in e Egypt this year, there is concern about a trend toward this temperature rising. This is not very reassuring and it calls for us, doubtlessly, to revisit our approaches and our policies that we have adopted. In this context, the African Climate Summit, which will be held in Nairobi in Kenya, under the joint leadership of the African Union and the Republic of Kenya from the 4th to the 7th of September of this year, that summit was a welcome initiative and an opportune initiative which shows the determination of Africa to participate actively in addressing this vital question and now to act as a heavyweight when it comes to providing solutions to global warming and to ensuring future economies that are more green and more responsibility. The Africans emerged from the summit with a set of shared specifications contained in the Declaration of Nairobi, which aim to ensure a reform of the international financial architecture, to ensure more fairness, restructuring, debt alleviation, uh, local transformation of their products, and putting in place a carbon tax regime, including a tax on the commerce in uh, fossil fuels and uh, maritime and air transport. They also recalled they also reminded the rich polluters of the commitments that they took on in 2009 but have yet to honor. That is to provide 100 billion U.S. dollars in climate financing. The Democratic Republic of the Congo calls upon the United Nations and upon the entire international community to pay particular attention to the legitimate claims of Africa. In this context, my country calls for the creation of a fair carbon market and we want to see incentivizing, an incentivizing of prices to bolster the efficacy of climate financing. We hope to see the rapid operationalization of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, and we support the idea of mutually beneficial partnerships 
between the state and the private sector. In the same vein, the Democratic Republic of the Congo reiterates its full readiness to cooperate with all stakeholders, public and private alike, in order to make the most of its strategic minerals, in order to achieve its environmental transition, and to take on bold commitments, notably the commitment of dedicating 30% of its national territory to the preservation of biodiversity, and to aim at a nationally determined contribution including measures based on four major sectors, agriculture, forestry, energy, technology transfer, and adaptation measures. President, multilateralism and the respect for a global rules-based system underpinned, has underpinned peace, security, health, and prosperity in large swaths of the world for the last 78 years. The United Nations embodies these principles and remains a key protagonist in order to cope with contemporary existential threats, be they the current food crisis, climate change, terrorism, or pandemics, or nuclear proliferation. None of these critical global threats can be resolved by nations that act by themselves, no matter how powerful they may be. All of this requires multilateral cooperation. To retain the trust of the international community, the United Nations needs to show that it is capable of adapting to the present and capable of effectively shouldering its responsibilities in tackling today's challenges. In order to provide new impetus, new impetus to multilateralism, the reform of the Charter of the United Nations on the key points, the Security Council, the veto in Chapter 7, the use of force, this is absolutely necessary but will not be sufficient. We have a lot of work to do, the coordination and cooperation among the various institutions and agencies of the United Nations are imperfect. The global challenges are often tackled several times over at various fora, uh, with different angles being taken, sometimes contradicting approaches being taken, and other problems are not addressed at all with each international bureaucracy aiming to save itself. In this regard, I wish to sound a stirring call, the call of Africa on the whole, a call to enlarge the United Nations Security Council as a guiding decision-making body of the United Nations to ensure that there are two representatives of the African continent there as permanent representatives in order to ensure fair and, e and representative geographical representation. Hence the relevance and the need to reform our 78-year-old organization, which is somewhat hobbled in the face of current, current changes and international trends, so as, so as to make it more inclusive in its composition and uh, in its composition and in how decisions are taken, the decisions that need to take into account the voice of Africa. President, before I conclude, allow me to speak from this high rostrum to speak about the question of violence against women in the context of war and in armed conflicts. It is no secret for anyone that the Democratic Republic of the Congo is one of the African states where sexual violence against women are most disconcerting due in particular to decades of armed conflict. In order to ease the suffering of women who have fallen victim to conflict-related violence and in order to begin to repair the harm done to them, my country has put in place specific institutional mechanisms. These are, notably, the National Fund for, represent, for Reparations to Victims of Sexual Violence, Conflict-Linked Sexual Violence, and to the Victims of Crimes Against Humanity, 
uh, Crimes Against the Peace and Security of Humanity. That organization was created in December 2022 and is known as FONARAV. In addition to these initiatives to protect and promote women, the DRC tirelessly strives to change the perceptions of that men have about women, notably by removing social structures that create barriers to the fulfillment of women and to address the power dynamics that underpin male-female relations. Indeed, the skills and resources given to women are not enough in and of its in and of themselves to change their condition. It is vital to move farther and to change the social dynamics in couples and families and in communities. This is what underpins the promotion of positive masculinity, which is an initiative that I started from the beginning of my mandate at the helm of the African Union. President of the General Assembly of the United Nations, heads of state and government, Secretary General of the United Nations, heads of delegations. In closing, I wish to confirm once more that at the end of this year, general elections will be held in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And this will happen in institutions with an electoral mandate uh, down to the level of the communes. In order to ensure those elections are a success, all parties involved are actively working. The independent electoral, com independent national electoral commission, the CENI, has already convened the electoral core and published lists of candidates for national and provincial legislative and municipal elections. Provisions are being put in place in order to ensure transparency, inclusivity, equal opportunities, and cred credibility of these upcoming elections. Invitations have already been sent out to international institutions and international organizations, to NGOs that specialize in this area, in order to mandate their electoral observation missions to accompany the process and to help the Congolese state consolidate its young democracy. The UN is also invited to play a major role via its specialized institutions. The Congolese government thanks already those institutions and NGOs that have been invited that are already hard at work. The Democratic Republic of the Congo remains convinced that the United Nations remains the most appropriate fora to discuss the future of our planet and of the relations both among peoples and among states. Following the holding of the peaceful democratic elections in Zimbabwe, I wish to sound a clarion call here at the United Nations calling for everything to be done to ensure the immediate lifting of these sanctions against the Republic of Zimbabwe and against its people. Nonetheless, to effectively discharge its important and delicate mission and to deserve the confidence of everyone, the UN needs to embody the values of justice, equity, and solidarity. The UN must be representative of everyone in all our cultural, political, economic, and social diversity. This is the full meaning behind the reform. This is what underpins the reform that the Africans have often reiterated and the fight that we must all participate in. I thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo for the statement just made and request protocol to escort His Excellency.